The Faroes are a group of islands in the North Atlantic, about 300 kilometers north of the Scottish mainland. And while they are technically a part of the Kingdom of Denmark, they are practically an independent country, with a very extensive autonomy as agreed upon in the Treaty of Fumien in 2005. So, unlike Denmark, they are not a part of the EU, and they also have not signed the Schengen Agreement. There are even a lot of voices in the Faroese Parliament, the so-called Lukting, who argue that the island should secede from Denmark completely. But of course, this was not always the case, and Denmark used to hold a very firm grip over the islands. For a very long time it was believed that the Faroe Islands were never settled until the 9th century, but the discovery of non-native barley grains from the 4th century suggested that the islands had been inhabited by humans before, even if only temporarily. We don't know who they were, or where they came from, but we know that the Vikings arrived sometime around 820. Very quickly, people from Scandinavia, Scotland and Ireland began to set up communities on the Faroes. They were usually farmers who specialised in sheep breeding, hence the name of this region, because Faroyar can be translated with Sheep Islands. Quickly, the islands became a republic and the Lukting, one of the oldest parliaments in the world, was created. In the 11th century, the islands adopted Christianity and became a part of the Norwegian crown. Norway would in turn end up under a personal union with Denmark 250 years later, but the Faroes remained a Norwegian possession. That didn't stop the Danes, who over the course of the following centuries extended their reach and their control over the islands. In the 16th century, Denmark tried to sell this not exactly profitable archipelago to England twice, but both offers were declined. So the Danes decided to set up a trade monopoly in 1535, which was granted to various individuals and companies in exchange for a fixed annual payment into the royal treasury. The first monopolist was a merchant from Hamburg, who held his post for 20 years. Trade monopolies, or private monopolies in general, are usually not a good idea, but they made sense in that context. It was the only way to make sure that a steady supply reached those faraway islands. But, of course, most merchants tried to maximise their profits and imported cheap, low-quality products to then export all of these sought-after Faroese sheep pelts. In 1538, the Reformation spread from the Danish mainland over to the Faroes, and Danish became the official language, not just in church, but also elsewhere. But still, the Danish influence was not exactly felt by most people, as Denmark would mostly keep out of the Faroese affairs, collect taxes once per year, observe the yearly gathering of the Lukting, and... That was about it, really. In general, it's fair to say that it was a very peaceful society, with only a few homicide and theft incidents. The majority of the criminals were adulterers and people who had committed incest, but even their numbers were not exactly extraordinarily high by comparison with other countries. There was one threat, however, that constantly loomed over the pharaohs. That of pirates. They usually came from France, Ireland or England, or sometimes even from North Africa, and plundered everything they could find. To increase the local defences, the Skansen Fortress was built in the late 16th century. Later, a second one was built on the Tinganes Peninsula. The town of Tolshaun was garrisoned by about 30 underpaid and undermotivated militiamen. They seemed to be sufficient though, because after that a period of peace ensued until the French plundered and desecrated the city in 1677 during the Scadian War. The last private person to hold the trade monopoly over the islands was a certain Frederick von Gabel, a Danish merchant. His rule was unpopular, to say the least, as he often imprisoned his opponents while his subordinates imposed an almost tyrannical order on the pharaohs. Because of that, the Danish crown took back control over the islands and its trade in 1709, which most people on the island considered to be a massive improvement. Half a century later, the islands would experience a true golden era when a Danish merchant called Niels Ruberg founded a smuggling port in Tolshaw. You see, in the second half of the 18th century, Britain was fighting quite a considerable amount of wars against the French and later against the Americans and the French. To finance these ventures, Britain imposed high import tolls on essentially all the trade goods, which made smuggling extremely profitable. Suddenly, dozens of ships from all over the world docked at Tolshall. Their number became so high that a lighthouse had to be built to protect the smuggling ships. Because of Denmark's neutrality, the trade could go on uninterruptedly, and goods such as tea, rum, gin, tobacco and brandy were exported mostly to Britain. However, all good things have to come to an end, and in 1784, Britain pressured Denmark into closing down the smuggling depot. To the Faroese population, those 20 years were extremely profitable, and not just from a financial viewpoint. 
For the first time in centuries, foreigners actually set foot on the island and brought valuable knowledge with them, such as how to salt herring and how to make clipfish. Additionally, a man called Nelsoya Paul proved himself to be a capable navigator and merchant during those years. He had sailed to France, England, the Caribbean, North America and Copenhagen, and in 1800 he returned back home with big ambitions. He revolutionised the Faroese boat by changing the shape of the sails, and he also constructed the first ever Faroese owned ship, the Roin din Frida. During a bad year of fishing in 1805, Paul tried to help the population by exporting Faroese coal to Denmark and then returning with foodstuffs, but he was prohibited from conducting his own trade because of the monopoly. But hey, at least he managed to take the smallpox vaccine with him on his way back, which allowed the Faroese to get vaccinated for the first time. When he tried to trade directly again the next year, he was convicted by the Toshaun district sheriff for smuggling. He quickly became one of the main opponents of the trade monopoly, and he would write a number of satirical poems arguing for its abolition. During the British naval blockade of the Faroes, Paul attempted to import grain to the starving population, but he got lost at sea sometime in 1809. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Denmark was not in a good shape. Copenhagen had been destroyed, the country was drowning in debt, and the Treaty of Kiel dissolved the personal union with Norway. During those times, the calls for free trade started to quiet down on the Faroe Islands, as it wouldn't benefit anyone for now at least. The Danish decided that it was time to reform the country and dissolve the Lugtig, which had become a mere shadow of its former self, as it had not been called into session for like half a century. The Faroes received a new high authority, the so-called Amtmand, who was a provost, a judge, a tax collector and a manager of trade at the same time. This post was usually held by a person from Denmark. After the revolution of 1848, Denmark abolished its absolutist system and replaced it with a constitutional monarchy. The Faroes were considered an integral part of Denmark and were granted a seat in the newly created lower house, the Folketing, and another one in the upper house, the Landsting. In 1852, the Lugting was revived, albeit only with an advisory function. And just four years later, the trade monopoly was abolished, a move which opened the way for the Faroes to become a modern trade economy. During the second half of the 19th century, this previously very patriarchal peasant community suddenly saw a lot of changes happen in a very short period of time. The Faroese language had only existed in spoken form, while Danish was the sole language used in all aspects of official life. But in 1846, linguists invented the Faroese written language, and six years later the first newspaper written completely in Faroese was published. The fishing industry started to boom, and soon made up 93.7% of the island's exports. School became compulsory for all Faroese children, and in 1861 the first high school opened in Toshan. Over the following decades, almost all villages received a school building, and a very specialised school of navigation was opened a few years later. With all the social and economic advancements arose the question of the Faroese identity and how it differed from that of the Danes. In December of 1888, a group of students met in Toshaun to discuss how to defend the Faroese language and culture. They demanded that Faroese should become the main language in schools, in churches and in public offices. And one year later, the Faroese Society was founded, an organisation dedicated to honouring the Faroese language. As the 20th century came about, calls for more autonomy for the islands became a lot more vocal, especially after the creation of the Home Rule Party. They demanded that the Lugting should be given more powers over the legislation, and they wanted Faroese to become equal with Danish, which was still the dominant language. In 1918, they managed to receive the absolute majority of the seats in the Lugting, which shows just how important the issue had become in the preceding decades. And from the 1910s up until the 1930s, a language dispute flamed up between the Unionists and the Separatists in the Faroese Parliament. The Unionists wanted to embrace the Faroese languages, but wished for Danish to remain the language of education. They argued that Faroese people should be able to study in Danish universities, and that Faroese shouldn't be imposed simply for dogmatic reasons. The separatists, on the other hand, argued that the mother tongue should be the most important language. After all, in any other realm within the Danish kingdom, people were allowed to use their native languages in schools. Icelandic in Iceland, German in Schleswig, Greenlandic in Greenland, and English in the Caribbean. Why should it be any different here? In the end, the separatists prevailed, and gradually Danish was replaced more and more by the Faroese language. In 1938, Faroese became an official language at schools, just one year later it was allowed to be used in church, and it began to be used more and more in courts as well. 
During the Second World War, Britain invaded and occupied the islands to make sure that the Germans wouldn't get their greasy little hands on them. The British recognised the Faroese flag in order to be able to differentiate hostile Danish ships from friendly ones. They also built an airport, but allowed the Lucting to essentially govern itself, and a provisional government was established, completely independent from Danish control. The relative success led many people to believe that the islands should be completely independent, especially after Iceland proclaimed its independence in 1944. Two years later, an independence referendum was held, and it was very, very, very narrowly accepted by a small majority. Denmark, however, refused to accept this result, dissolved the Lukting and demanded new elections. Luckily though, they agreed to negotiate and granted the Faroes far-reaching autonomy within the Kingdom of Denmark. This deal was acceptable to both sides. Today the Faroes have their own passports, their own currency, their own number plates, and their own post stamps. But it was only in 2005 that these beautiful islands received control over their foreign and security policies, which essentially makes them an independent country today. Right, thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed today's video. A very special and heartfelt thanks goes out to A Cup of Tea and James. If you want, please consider joining these lovely people in supporting me on Ko-Fi. But anyway, goodbye and see you next time.